Unlocking uncertainty about the future might come down to understanding and predicting how people make decisions. So combining neuroscience with strategic planning makes a lot of sense. That's what Bree Lincoln-Hoker is doing. She is the director of Worldview Stanford, a program teaching leaders how to prepare for future strategic challenges. Bree, thanks so much for being here today. Thank you. I thought I'd start by asking you about Worldview Stanford. What is Worldview Stanford and what are you doing over on the campus? So the short story about Worldview Stanford is that we create media and learning experiences for professional and public audiences. And what this really means is that we're working hard to find new ways to get the knowledge being created at Stanford out into the world in useful ways. Um, Stanford and other research universities have done a great job historically of getting new information out to other expert audiences. But as we know now, if you're a decision maker, there's no one field of expertise that you need to be up on. You need to be a little bit up on a lot of things. Um, if your worldview today isn't different than it was a year ago, you're not learning the way you should be as a leader, as a professional, as someone trying to navigate this complex hairball of a planet that we live on. Um, so, you know, we look at worldview as something that's not static, that's constantly changing, and that needs to be informed by every discipline out there. What I really appreciate about what you're doing is that you are helping uh, learners change their worldview and that your classes and courses are really focused on future-oriented topics, uh, like one of your marquee courses, The Science of Decision Making. Can you tell us a little bit about the essence of that course and why it's so important for leaders to understand uh, how they make decisions and some of the factors that are often invisible that go into helping them understand how to think about those decisions on behalf of future choices? Yeah, I mean, all of us are decision makers, right? Um, we, we tend to think about decision makers as being people in leadership positions, but every person who works in your organization, every member of your family, every member of your community is a decision maker. Um, if you sell a product, if you partner with people, um, if you try to anticipate government regulations, um, you have to be thinking not just about your own decisions, but you have to anticipate how other people make decisions too. And we realized that the only way to do that was to combine a lot of different perspectives. There's no single set of answers. There are as many unanswered questions as there are answered questions. When we set out to make the decision-making course, um, we realized pretty quickly, wow, we've got to have information from economics, psychology, neuroscience, philosophy and religion. Um, we needed information increasingly on AI and how computers are learning to make decisions, how they might support our decision making in the future. Um, it was really a lot of disciplines, a lot of perspectives. If you go out into the world as a professional and you think that you're going to keep up with the demands of your job by taking the occasional course or reading the newspaper, you're gonna be pretty sorely disappointed over time. The, the amount of learning that we have to do to keep up with the way the world is changing is incredible. And I think that the best way to do that is to immerse yourself from time to time in a variety of perspectives that's just gonna challenge the way you see the world. And that's what we try to do. I know in your course on decision making, you spend a lot of time talking about heuristics and biases, and that is a great intersection with your background around neuroscience. What are we learning about heuristics and biases and how they play into our decisions? Heuristics are critical for us to move about in the world. Um, we make thousands of decisions every day. If we didn't have them, we would be paralyzed. So what happens to turn a heuristic then into a bias? Um, heuristics are great in, I don't know, just say 95% of situations. It's that 5% or maybe even 1% that they're really not so great in. And that's when we have to become aware of them. Um, it doesn't matter so much that we're not aware of them when we're driving to work or um, deciding what to make for dinner. They can become absolutely essential um, when we're making a decision. Just take hiring for a moment. How many years a hire is going to impact your organization? If you're looking at 5, 10, 15, 20 years, um, having the right person in a role uh, could change the future of your business entirely. That's one of those areas where you really need to be aware of your own heuristics and biases, and we all have them. 
there's no getting rid of them. There's only becoming aware of them. We're all going to be affected by race, gender, age, um, name, um, how the person presents, if we see them in person, if we've seen their face. Um, they're gonna be things that we can't possibly control for. So the best way to make these decisions is to use multiple people. Um, and really try to call out and control for those biases. But we can't control for them until we know what they are, right? Become aware of the three or four that are really big deal and ask other people on the team to try to bring them up and put simple things in place um, to, to try to control for them. So heuristics and biases are very much topical these days because of this fantastic book, The Undoing Project, about uh, Danny Kahneman and Amos Tversky and the, the foundational work they did in understanding human decision making. They really gave rise to the whole field of behavioral economics. Um, and in the last, I'd say, 10 to 20 years, probably 10 to 15, neuroeconomics has really taken off. So neuroeconomics is the combining of behavioral economics with neuroscience. Now, let's break that down a little bit more. Behavioral economics is mostly kind of using economic games and economic choices that have numbers associated with them that have real world application. How much would you spend to, to buy A versus B? If I offered you, you know, X dollars for this thing that you have, would you take it or would you say no, right? So it's, it's taking, it's trying to understand human decision making in, um, in a format that's easy to understand within a laboratory setting and easy to quantify. Now you bring neuroscience into that, and so you can have people doing those kinds of tasks, making those kinds of semi-real world decisions in a brain scanner, and we can now start to understand well, what's going on in the brain while people are making decisions. It's really about trying to build our models of decision making. We have amazing behavioral observations. Now we're combining it with brain data. So I think in another 10 or 15 years, we're probably gonna have really rich models of how we actually make decisions and what's going on in the brain to support those. I think where we are right now in the science of decision making, we're at this place where we have kind of three areas of really exciting research. So we know a lot about the brain, um, we've learned a lot more about the brain um, in the last 20 years with the advent of neuroimaging. There's also a lot we know about behavior in really controlled settings, which is what academic research is you know, entirely about, right? Um, so we know when you control every variable except this one, um, what happens, you know, how does that one variable affect decision making? And then increasingly we have an amazing set of real world data. And I say increasingly because the amount of data that we can get about real world decisions online has taken off, as you might imagine, over the last 20 years. What hasn't happened yet is the connections between those three. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, whew, we're gonna be in a totally new era of understanding human decision making. Bree, as a neuroscientist, I'd love to ask you your thoughts on the future of neuroscience. It seems like a field that is advancing very quickly. What do you see on the frontier and, and what can we expect in the next five to 10 years? It's about to get huge. Um, and that's because more people in um, fields from chemical engineering to economics to computer science, um, even literature are starting to um, to gather around questions that have to do with the brain and behavior. This is gonna change everything, and it already is. It's already giving us new tools um, for doing experiments in the brain, new ways of observing what's happening in the brain. There are still huge questions. I think that neuroscience has not really done a lot to leverage big data. And in fact, there are a lot of conversations right now about how do we share data? How do we learn from other people's data? Neuroscience up to now has largely been an endeavor that's done by individual scientists and individual labs with small teams. And they're people who are trying to break that model down. So I'm very excited about where it's gonna go. What are we learning about big data these days as it relates to how organizations need to be thinking about value? Oh, good question, and it's constantly changing. Um, one of the things we hear most frequently is more data all the time will lead to better decisions. And we know that that just isn't true. So um, if you go back into cognitive science, 
Um, more data often leads to worse decisions. Um, it puts you in a state of cognitive overload. It's too many variables to think about. So you end up doing what humans always do. You look for the shortcut that's going to help you get to a pretty good decision. And most of the time, that's terrific except for when the world is changing. And if the world is changing, um, that shortcut that you've relied on for so long is going to lead you potentially down precisely the wrong path. So one of the things that I always ask people to think about is what is the information you need? Not just what is the data, but what is the information? What is the knowledge you would like to have as an organization to make a better decision? Why do you think that knowledge would help you make a decision, better decision? Um, and when you think about it that way, and you're thinking about the value that's kind of wrapped up in our understanding of information and knowledge, it makes you think a little bit differently about data. And if you think about the way data works in most organizations, there are a few people who actually have the skills, the capacity to go query that data, a very few people. And most of the time, those people are not the people who are uh, making decisions. They may not be the people who are the best at customer insight. They may not be the people who are up on what's going on at a global economic level. Trying to get the information that's embedded in all those numbers that's kind of kept by those gatekeepers who are the only ones with the skills to query it out and socialized is a really big challenge. And so that's why I think we have to have more conversations within organizations about what information do we need and why. I think it used to be when data was the thing that was um, the bottleneck for us, when you could really say, if only I had more data, I could make a better decision. It was, that was a different time. We're not in that time now. Now we're in the, if I look at all the data, I will be paralyzed. I will not be able to make a decision. That's the world we live in now. We have to go to a different way of thinking um, about what's really meaningful. What do we know? What do we hypothesize? What do we believe to be true? What are our assumptions? How might those be challenged? When should we reject them? I also think that um, we're in a time now where we have to realize that any one mind is insufficient. There is no way that this human mind or that human mind can really encompass all of the ideas, knowledge, variables, et cetera, that you would like to have be part of your decision-making process. We have to depend upon each other. Um, and there are really easy ways to do this. Um, if you think about a, a difficult decision-making process under uncertainty, it's very easy to say, you're going to be the skeptic, right? You're going to go out and you're going to find all the reasons to be skeptical of this idea. You're going to find out, you know, you're going to pull together the data, you're going to pull together the arguments, you're going to be the skeptic person. I'm going to be the person who's all in, right? And I'm going to go do the same work. I'm going to gather the data. I'm going to make an impassioned argument. I'm going to argue against the stuff that you're putting in front of me, right? Um, we wear different hats. And when we do that, we, don't, we can free ourselves from having to be the master of all data, right? Um, instead, what then we have to do is be the master of the conversation. We have to be the person who's present, who's listening. So there are these little things that we can do. They're human things. They don't always feel techy, you know, or really like they're super advanced algorithms or anything like that. But at the end of the day, it's humans still who make decisions. Um, and the better we can become as individuals and as groups at doing that, the better we're going to be. Data is never going to be better than the questions you ask of it. Right? Um, so you can have all the data in the world. You can have the most precise data. If you don't know what to ask of that data and you don't know what to conclude from that data, it is not useful to you. Um, and no machine in the next little while is going to be better than we are at asking questions. Machines could be far better, in fact, already are far better, in pulling out patterns that might be good answers to those questions. But the best questions come from us, from our brains, and that is not going to change anytime soon. So if there was one skill I would want to see leaders really try to develop, it's that asking critical questions, being open to other people who ask questions differently. In fact, seeking people out who can challenge their assumptions, even surface those assumptions, that's the skill set. That's what's going to make all of that data and all of those algorithms that are now in our fingertips actually useful.